Annie, how are you? Very well, very well. How are you? Yeah, we very finally, good. We finally meet online. <laughs> I know. But Annie, this is this is exciting. There's a few questions that I would love to um get into because uh, your the advice that coming from you, uh, coming from NIDA and being an actor and and def- and going to WA and taking on some a, a challenge that you know I guess people said that it was a tough market for you to break into and you've been one of the most successful casting directors in all of Australia. And I'd like to know how do you, uh, what's your, I guess, how do you and how do you think a casting director and an actor should maintain a relationship or or hold a relationship? Because there's, there is a, a general, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, myth that, you know, casting directors and actors are, are on the different page, but it's not at all. Everyone I talk to, we're all on the same team and we all want to, uh, we all want to work together. And how do you think that relationship should be? Be. Um... I think it should be, a, a, and for the most part, I believe it's a very constructive relationship and should be because, and maybe when I was an actor, I didn't realise this as much, but a casting director is able to really advocate for an actor because part of my job as a casting director is to see and be aware of it as many actors work and capabilities and potential um, as possible so that when I'm casting a project, I can suggest to the director and the producer, um, the production company, a range of possible actors who may be appropriate for that role. And so many times I think a casting director will have seen you as an actor in something and and be aware of something you're able to do that perhaps the director or the producers or the production company will not be aware of. Um, yeah, so I think it, you know, if anything, we are advocates for yeah. actors and should be, <clears throat> should be advocates for actors. So it's not, I think sometimes when I was an actor a long time ago, I think a lot of actors thought of casting directors as being gatekeepers and not allowing people through. I don't believe that that is the case. Sometimes directors will have particular strong opinions on who they would like to audition for a role or who they feel would be right and of course the casting director will always defer and um, is there to assist the director and the producer and the production company so we never have the final say ever Um, and it's always a collaborative process and it's always so I almost feel like sometimes I'm a conduit between the actor their agent often and then the director and the producer and do you think that comes from from actors as as actors and when we come out of drama school um we think that we can do anything we can do any role um and then when you're in it for a while you realize that there's a business here this is a business side and you need to um know your type and push push your type forward and is is that something that you see as actors, especially in Australia, not knowing their type, and uh, maybe I guess being being a bit of a pain, and, and uh, you know approaching casting directors such as yourself or agents, and um, why didn't I go up for that role? Or um, oh look, I, to be perfectly honest, um, actors don't often say that to me um when I came out of acting school I remember I thought I was so incredibly multi-talented on Mm -hmm. graduating from NIDA that I could play a 90 year old woman or I could play this or that sorry we've got a a police car going by I might even close my window Um, and the reality is for film and television particularly If they need, if they've got a a, a character of a 90-year-old woman, they will cast an actor who is close to that in in age and type. Um, They're not, unless you are a huge name, 
you know, you know, say a Russell Crowe who particularly wants the challenge of aging up for a role. And therefore, the reality is that you will normally be cast close to your age and type. So it's good to know that. Having said that, though, that doesn't mean that should pigeonhole you into diminishing the possibility of the roles you can play. But what I would say, the, the most important thing is to keep developing your skills. Mm -hmm. Never stop developing and learning your craft. Uh, I think that that is singularly the most important thing that I notice in the most, you know, in most successful actors is that they keep learning, you know, they keep um, improving. Now, whether that's by doing classes, whether that's by having, you know, coaching, private coaching, um, whether it's by having experience on set by playing roles, it's, it's a craft and it's one that you need to keep working at. So sometimes I think um, actors, I've noticed it more in Australia, um, will do some training and then go, I'm a trained actor, that's it, and then um, do auditions, but then often feel like they've done that portion they've done that training but if you start to listen to some of the great interviews and podcasts with successful actors around the world you'll just realize how people keep stretching and keep trying you know um Heath Ledger who I was very um honored to cast in his first role he ended up not going through any of the degree courses of acting but ended up um you know, moving to Sydney and then LA from Perth. And, and he had, he kept having coaches to help him prepare for auditions. And then when he started being cast in roles, he had coaches, um, a, a coach to help him um, develop the character and prepare. And in fact, there was an Irish, um, I think, uh, the guy's been credited as a voice coach, but really, he was also yeah, I know him. He's from the um, the Galti. In, is it the Galti or no? It's in Dublin, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. And so I think that that's an important thing. You know, the, people often talk about Naomi Watts who went to LA and she did auditions and did classes and had coaching for 10 years before she scored, you know, really significant roles, you know, and often it takes time and energy and effort yeah that's interesting you uh you brought it up i was actually going to ask you that later on but i might as well jump into it advice to actors to keep training because i know you're involved with training in wa and here in sydney uh a great friend of mine who's who's a wonderful actor um during covid he instead of shying away he he seized the opportunity he created a group theater uh, and I was one of the first members because he dragged me in and he knew if we were going to be working on Irish plays, I, w I was in. So we just finished Eugene O'Neill. Um, but he, the way he structured it, it is unbelievable. It's working on the, the, the plays and then uh, recording them in the costume and come bringing in professional people to take headshots in the costume because that's your niche and that's who you are. Um, and that came from because we're working with Eric Morris in Los Angeles. Um, and we seen the dedication of the, the students there that wasn't here. We couldn't believe how dedicated they were and how hungry and how, how hardworking they were. And what would be the kind of advice you would see? Um, what would be the kind of advice you'd give to Australian actors? And that could be just recently, a lot of acting teachers have gone online as well. Um, and how can actors stay, stay, I guess, stay, stay prepared for when that opportunity comes? Um, I think it is a matter of being in training and having your skills honed. I don't think any actor who, who hasn't been in front of a camera in the last six months I don't think any actor uh, will do a great screen test in that case. And now, thank God, unfortunately, actors can practice and do self-tapes 
from the comfort of their home. They can take as long as they like. They can have a colleague or, or a, a, you know, a buddy who is a fellow actor to read opposite them. You, it's put a lot more control into the hands of the actor. I mean, I love being in the audition room and screen testing actors and, and playing with them. But I also realise in times of COVID, this is impractical in a lot of cases and unsafe at some times. Um, when a long time ago, when I was studying and doing some postgrad study at RADA in London, I remember one day coming uh, going into the courtyard for lunch, and one of my the fellow actors in the course that I was studying was there memorizing her lines for Juliet from Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare's play, and. Um, I started chatting to her and I said, ah, oh, are you going to play Juliet? And she said, yeah, one day. <laughs> and she was memorising the whole part and working on the character just on the possibility that she would get an audition at some stage to play Juliet. And to me, I think that typifies in a lot of cases um, the professionalism or the commitment that many actors have overseas and sometimes I think um, you know Aussie actors sometimes rest on their laurels more you know also at that time actors there in the UK would always have three monologues prepared to to be ready to perform at any time and they would they would um, freshen them up you know, regularly. Mm -hmm. I keep doing training just because I'm fascinated by the craft and I'm interested in the craft. And so I won't ever stop, you know, yeah. it's one of those things that I think you, you need to keep constantly um, developing your skills and, uh, and training, um, reading plays, reading screenplays, which are all so accessible now. Um, when myself and my um, fellow actors who graduated with me from NIDA decades ago, none of us could own a, a video camera. They were gigantic and they cost a lot and we couldn't afford those. So we couldn't. It was, it was very difficult to practice um, your screen skills, at least, in that way. And at that time, we got two crappy weeks of training in the whole three-year degree for film and television. And that was one of the, the things that bugged me and annoyed me then, that there was so much emphasis on theatre, but there was so little on film and television. And yet it was far more lucrative for me, you know, um, once I was working as an actor um, in film and TV. And that's one of the reasons why I've, since I moved to Western Australia, I have kept... Um, being an acting coach as well and have been a sessional um, lecturer um, throughout the years, you know, casual out at WAPA, the WA Academy of Performing Arts here, um, because I do think it's, uh, it's vital for actors um, to have those skills and to get comfortable in front of a camera because it's a different medium to stage. Mm -hmm. And do you still see a bit of uh, a... Um, do you still see a, a push for theatre or, or an interest for theatre for young actors? Um, I, I know for theatre, that's the reason why I got into it was the, the love of some of the plays that I read. Um, and, and just doing this group theatre, it's, uh, it's unbelievable to work on such good writing that I think the writing is so good that when you do pick up a script, you can go, oh, I get that. I think I think when actors are inspired by the love of the creativity of developing a role and performing and and having that immediacy of an audience response, um, that's something that uh, gives you. Someone said to me, it's a little bit like being addicted to cocaine, and then suddenly when COVID happened, it was like withdrawal. <laughs> and um you know the reality is that buzz you get from an audience in that way is um 
very powerful, I think, and the sense that you are communicating and are able to give your performance as a gift to that audience is very powerful. I think sometimes for film and television, because you don't have the immediacy of an audience there and because you have less control over the end product, sometimes what, what you might consider to be your best take will end up on the cutting room floor um, in serving the story and uh, in serving the director's vision for the piece. But I think that both stage and screen are vital components for any actor. Maybe the sheer fact that sometimes when you, maybe there's more blue sky possibility with screen because mm -hmm. our many actors, many Australian actors have done extremely well overseas. And when they get into big budget productions, they can command very high fees and they would, are never likely to command those kind of fees in theatre. And also they could be on, you know, for instance, if you're an actor and you're about to be cast in one of the latest uh, or the prequel to Game of Thrones and you're going to be signed up for potentially five years of options, you know, the you, just the... I suppose um, the size of that job is massive and the possibility for earning income from that is massive too. So I suppose there's that aspect as well. Whereas if you're in a play, it's never normally a, an incredibly long run unless it's something, you know, on Broadway or the West End that has an income. Mm -hmm. uh, being at NIDA and um, Sydney in general, it's, it's relatively a new country compared to London because uh, the stage in London is pretty, it, it, it's everywhere in the West End and then you've got Broadway. Um, is, it's such a shame because there's such talented actors here in Australia uh, that I see every day. But do you, do you, was there a big, uh, was it mainly theatre that you worked on in NIDA? Is that what NIDA is about? Like yeah. you, it, it was is. then, it was then. But I think yeah. it's, I think and I'm hoping and I do believe that they have introduced more screen training into their degree course. Yeah, I believe so. And, and I know it, that I know that WAPA does. Um, it's, yeah, it's, well, yeah. it's had a lot more because it also has collaborations between the WA Screen Academy, which is um, also on the same campus of the, as the university. Uh, the same, it's part of the same university that WAPA the WA Academy of Performing Arts is on. And so they actually do joint productions where the actors act in the films and the short films that the directing and filmmaking students make. So yeah, they certainly, they certainly do provide. Um, so moving to, to just COVID, so we're post COVID and, and we hear a lot of talk around that. We post there's a lot yet? of, <laughs> well, I, it, we hear a lot that there's a lot coming to Australia as in production wise um, that is uh, there's there's always something about you know the, the big productions they're they're generally the main the main roles are filled and when they get here they'll they'll start to fill out the other roles is there a way of how actors can stay ahead of that curve and know what's coming and, and try and um, prepare for certain shows that are coming up or certain movies that are coming up that we could prepare a little clip it and send it in to wh whoever we know is casting for a certain role question good question so i would say that your your agent um would hopefully know about or find out about things of course some of the productions that are moving here were scheduled to be filmed in the states and have been brought here as almost a last minute change because we've got safety here and people can mm -hmm. film here safely. Um, I, I often say to actors, keep your ear to the ground, find out and, and do a bit of research for yourself. So for instance, I just had, um, I'm on the executive of the Casting Guild of Australia and we just um, organized a webinar with IMDB Pro 
showing us some of the added features of IMDb Pro and just this morning. And one oh, of the wow. things you can do is if you're an IMDb Pro member, you can go into a section where it tells you about productions in development and it has the details of those and the details of, of who is attached or who's involved. Um, so that's one way. Is that by location? You, yeah, you can do searches. You can oh, do, wow. You know, there's quite a few um, capabilities that you can search. Um, you, so that's one thing. You can also sign up to receive e-news from your state fun, film funding and screen funding bodies. Um, so, um, uh, you know, Screen New South Wales, uh, Screen West here in Western Australia, Film Victoria. And they will often have in their um, email news, they will often in include development funding of projects. So if you go on and look at that, you can start to see what TV series are being developed, what films have just received funding to be made. Um, and find out about some of that. And then when you hear about those things, um, contact your agent if you have an agent and say, look, I would love to be considered or to audition for, um, for mm -hmm. a role in this. You know, do you think it's possible? If you're freelance, then try to, to be proactive. I think also um, there's a fine line between hounding or badgering people and mm -hmm. also just being a bit cheeky and and, and um, inventive one of our Perth um, gorgeous actors she was uh, recently telling me how there was a tv show in Australia that she loved she was based in LA and so she managed to grab some of the footage from it um just off the television, I think, or however she was watching it. And then she filmed herself and, and created a fictional conversation between her and one of the lead male character and made it as a funny, humorous thing. And she ended up sending it into them. They liked it so much that they offered her a role. No way. In that show, she came back under her own steam from the States. She played that role. And now with the male um, lead actor of that, she and he are developing a comedy, a, a new comedy series together. So I suppose it's, it's, it's working out what you want to do and the kind of roles you want to play and the type of productions or, or um, what excites you and really helping to manifest that by doing some research and thinking laterally sometimes as well. Yeah, because it really is, it does, because it really is a collaboration between you and your agent. And it's not a sit back and wait for it. I think you've got to be proactive and you've got to be hungry and you've got to want it, but you've got to be respectful. Uh, and I think that there's opportunity today with social media. And as you said, making little skits that there's no reason that you should ever be not working. Even if it is just a funny little video like she did and send it in. Um, there's just so much opportunity. You can do in, in keeping your craft skills up, that definitely. Now, you may not be getting paid for everything that you do, but oh, yeah. you know, just getting a scene partner or a friend and working on things or doing like you're talking about, you know, the theatre company that you've um, become involved with too. All of those things are going to keep your, your skills current and and alive and and vibrant I would, I would and say. i think that they attract the right people as well we've had um you maybe you know him he actually taught at nida kevin jackson oh yeah i know kevin very well Kevin's, he taught me when i was at NIDA. Did he? That's how long ago <laughs> he's coming into um critique or we're working on clifford odets he's coming into work critique clifford odets and i've been told be prepared with your punctuation your full stops, your commas. So, oh, he's a um, wonderful director. He directed me in a Sam Shepard play when I was at NIDA. Oh, wow. Last year, very child. And it was such a joy to work with Kevin because he was very demanding as a director. 
but it gave you such a powerful base. And he also gave you the freedom to experiment within any performance. Mm-hmm. It was really exciting, really exciting. And I'm so glad that he's um, he's recovered from his ill yes. health recently. Yeah, because- yeah. Yeah, it's just wonderful. I'm so pleased. Yeah. So I would like to talk about um, there's a big push, uh, and rightly so, for diversity um, worldwide, and um, it sh- it should have happened a long time ago. But th- do you still see there being gaps in the market? I mean, when I came, just to give you an idea, I, when I came to Australia, I kept thinking, you know, they're going to want that Irish guy for home and away, and I'm going to stick it out, and I'm going to get that role. But I keep hearing that the accent is a big problem, uh, the Irish accent. Sometimes when it comes through and you try to hide it with a bit of Australian, but it's, Australian is so hard to do. Um, do you think there still is a bit of... Uh, a bit of a gap where they could fit in more nationalities within certain roles and um i'm a great advocate for diversity and that's why when i was so thrilled to cast the heights uh, which is the 60 episode series we made for matchbox pictures um they made here in perth for the abc and in that we had a whole range of different nationalities. Um, we had LGBTQI um, characters played by those. We had a disabled lead character played by a disabled actor. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I I think it's I think it's a no brainer, and it and Australia is still way behind, still way behind. I think the UK at least. I think the UK has embraced different nationalities far or different uh, diverse uh, actors from a whole range of diverse backgrounds um, much more readily than Australia has. Um, So I certainly know from my own experience that um, casting for many decades you know, it's always been a standard question that I ask when I'm casting something is, would it be appropriate for this character who's written as male to be possibly played play by a female? Or could we cast, uh, you know, be colourblind with this and, and, play, and cast an Aboriginal actor in this role? Or, you know, those kinds of things. And there, there are certainly shifts happening and there are changes happening, um, thankfully. And, um, mm-hmm. and it's the Equity Ensemble Award, the Heights got the Equity Ensemble Award, which was wonderful. And I also got an award in the Casting Guild uh, Awards for the, mm-hmm. the casting of the Heights. Um, in terms of white Anglo-Saxon guys, you're probably not going to be in the in the target area that people are bending over backwards to cast right at the moment because there's been historically such, um, it has been much more challenging for people from um, uh, actors of colour, uh, you know, who, who haven't been able to, and women uh, too, mm-hmm. who have not had as many opportunities but there are always swings and roundabouts and things will change and there's still more male roles i think than than female roles i think you know so, definitely yeah. and so um i wouldn't give up you are in a better situation i think because your irish accent isn't extremely pronounced mm-hmm. you're, you're not I think I've learned that to I've learned to slow it down. It's like when I'm with some Australian people, but there's I meet some Irish people, they go, I have no idea what you guys just said. Uh, because when I came here, everybody would have to say sorry or excuse me, and I'll have to really slow it down and um and spell it out for them. And because I work in a Australian company, I've had to really craft that Irish accent a small bit. I don't think it would be very hard for you to Record and memorize a piece, a monologue 
with an Australian accent and learn it as you would a song mm. so that you, so it helped to get the rhythm in your head of that. And, and I think you would be surprised that it wouldn't be too major a shift for you. I, I like to do the Bolgan one. The, I, 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 love, I love doing the Bolgan, the Bolgan extreme. And then when they say bring it back, I, I don't know how to bring it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go for the country Australian accent. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So okay. you can hey, so, do that, I think. I really do. I think so. Good, Good practice. practice. Um, but, but when you're in the room and if, if you see, if you, you, if, if you know what the director is looking for, and you're in the room and you see somebody that's totally opposite. They could be totally opposite as in nationality, nationality or color. And they're so good. Would you go, you've got to see this person for the role? Would you always? Yeah. Absolutely. Because part what they're paying me to do is to bring another um, other possibilities into the mix. So certainly. And, you know, we had that on... We had that on the Heights where there was a whole one of the six core families of the Heights was going to be a particular Afri African nationality. And when I started researching to cast that and also researching within the community here in Western Australia, I realised that there could be some problems because of the storyline, because one of the lead characters in this family discovers he's gay and he's Muslim. And in this particular nationality in this country, that was, people were killed for that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just ended up having conversations with my producers saying, this is not only going to be hard to cast, this, there could be quite a backlash here when that community finds out about the storyline and the character in this, um, would you consider going for a Middle Eastern um, nationality for these roles? And they did and they were open to it. And so then I was able to go searching for uh, and we ended up casting a Persian-Iranian family for that and it worked really wonderful and Phoenix Rye who played that particular character did an amazing job and um, so yes certainly there are various mm -hmm. um, considerations to be taken into account but um, and similarly with the character of Sabine um, they wanted a character who had a disability but they weren't necessarily being prescriptive in the early stages of the casting as to what type of disability they wanted it to be some kind of physical um, or movement or disability and um, and yeah being able to cast wonderful Bridie McKim who has cerebral palsy in that role she was in her second year at NIDA when um, when we did the when we were going through the the casting for the first series and then um, there was delay in the filming um, date so they that it ended up being in her third year at NIDA and NIDA very wonderfully allowed her to take the time out and do it as an industry placement to play that role and oh, wow. uh, which was which was really wonderful yeah. and how important is it to um I dare say a, a day in the casting room of, of what you do, you would see a lot of people come in and do the same thing. How important is it to take a script and just be ballsy is all the words I can say is go and do something that's off the page, but relatable to the character uh, that's going to get you remembered. Um, I heard a wonderful story from a, a casting director in Dublin, Ireland, who um he actually cast a guy who was so wrong <laughs> in the audition, but because he was so wrong, everybody else came in and did the same thing, and that was the only guy he remembered. And that's why he cast him, because he said he was so wrong in the piece that we loved him. See, I don't even consider it to be wrong, but I think um, diversity and, you know, you look at an actor like Adam Driver who is so spontaneous and goes with really interesting impulses, I think that's great. I don't think there's any right way of playing a role mm -hmm. or character. 
Um, so to me, it's not so much wrong. But yes, certainly many actors will come in and they will deliver the initial and obvious interpretation of what that character might be. But more than anything, having coached actors for 30 years, the other thing that I would say is developing the ability to relax and be present in an audition or screen test so that whatever comes up, you go with using the script and the lines of dialogue, but you, you don't moment end moment. up pre-planning and then mm -hmm. just come in and do what you pre-planned in your bedroom <laughs> the night before because then you're not in the moment. And particularly for screen, we see that. We can yes. see it when, when someone is firing and connecting with their scene partner, then that's when the magic happens. So, so I think it's probably even more important to do all of your preparation, all of your homework, do all the given circumstances, work out what your character's objective is, what the obstacles are, you know, go through your circles of attention, your transition moments, you know, the relationships, your attitude to the different character in the scene, all of those things. But then most importantly, let that go when it comes time to perform it so that you can be there in the moment. And that's what I think actors like Catherine Hahn or Adam Driver or, you know, mm -hmm. that they have a Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, they have a spontaneity that is so unexpected at times and it's things that are hitting them at that moment mm -hmm. and look it's easier said than done but it's one of those my, one of my mantras is practice makes progress you know the more you you play with that and and do that um and whether doing the Meisner exercises repetition exercises uh, can help you or whether it's um exploring and going back to the basics the Stanislavski what's I think improvisation is really valuable to improvise in character before you start using the lines of the script can also tune your ear to listen mm -hmm. to your theme partner um, <clears throat> the thing that will set any actor apart from everyone else going for that role is themselves. So you have to be willing to be there in the scene. Yeah. There was a wonderful teacher who I studied with in Los Angeles, Judith Weston, and I remember her once saying a great way for the actor to look at, at characterisation is if you imagine that the character is you having lived all of the life experiences that this character has lived and that's brought you to this point and is the reason why you're saying and doing this now. And I think that psychologically is quite a valuable way to look at it, you know, particularly for screen. I think, I think that you, you really, you brought up something that's key that I think isn't practiced enough we're, we're so good at practicing the circumstances. And one thing that was really challenging for me and, and still is, and that I need to practice more is throwing it away. I don't know how to throw it away. I try to hold on to the, just like, you know, I'm talking to my mother and this is what I've, you know, of my past history. And I think that that's a real, that's an art form in itself of throwing it away. It's really difficult because particularly on screen because we we see you know I'll sit sometimes and be looking back at screen tests and viewing them with the producer and, and director and you can just see the subtleties that happen in an actor's face and you know I remember one director saying to me that's the moment the softening in the eyes at that point that you know, mm. I'm just drawn in and, you know, you, um, and I think to learn to relax enough to trust 
that you've done all the preparation and the work and now you can leave that behind. Mm -hmm. The wonderful um, interview that Viola Davis has given and where she talks about this, you know, and how um, you, you can't come in and, and deliver that performance that you, that you decided upon because <laughs> that's a little bit like, she didn't say this, but someone else has said this, it's a little bit like going into a tennis match and saying to your, your scene partner or, you know, the, the other person in a tennis match, oh, by the way, I just want to let you know that, that I'm winning this. this I've won this. <laughs> You know, and it's a little bit like that, you know, like that. that if if it's already predetermined what the outcome is, there is no play. There's mm -hmm. no play. You know, yeah. I, I would suggest that. Um, yeah. Annie, this is this has been great. And I want to finish up with the I always finish up with the same question of um if there was if if you could only give one piece of advice to somebody who wants to make it in the industry, what would that one bit of advice that you could give? And it could be anything to do with being respectful or work or just the what the industry, I guess, has taught you over these uh, over your uh, long career. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, when I, before I moved to Perth, decades ago and I started coaching actors in Sydney I used to feel quite nervous about saying to actors you know you should follow your heart and your passion you should listen to you what you really want to do and I was quite I used to feel nervous about saying that to people because I knew that you know probably 85 to 90 percent of actors in the country are unemployed at any one time. And then I married and had children and was working and I'd become a casting director and I was also an acting coach. And one of our three children was fascinated and loved acting himself. And he'd ended up, you know, playing some roles in um, the commercials and he'd got down to the final um final two for a lead role in the tv series not things i was casting by the way and um <laughs> and then out of the blue he was diagnosed with a spinal cord tumor and a biopsy was performed here in perth and it went wrong and it was botched and he ended up paralyzed from the neck down and Oh, God, this is so horrible. I hate remembering all this. Um, and he, we spent three months in hospital with him slowly gaining some feeling and movement um, back into one side of his body. Um, and after the local neurosurgeon told us his tumour could not be removed and we should enjoy the last months with him, we looked elsewhere, my husband and I, and found a brilliant neurosurgeon in Sydney, Charlie Teo, and we took our son to Charlie and Charlie removed the tumour. And he, um, thank God he removed the tumour, and he um, was left hemiplegic from that initial biopsy. I remember in those months and months of sitting next to his bed thinking, if you have the gift, if you have, it is a gift. If you are, if you are drawn to express yourself creatively as an actor or an artist or a musician, and you have the capability to touch people in that way, I think you have a responsibility to yourself and to the world to honour that. And over decades, I have taught so many people over the years who have gone away and done science degrees or commerce degrees or all these other things, really because their parents wanted them to, and they still come back around to what I really want to be doing is acting. And I think, I think you have that gift and not everybody has it and not everybody has that capability. And I think it's so important to honour that. Thank God my son went on and um, he, he ended up getting into 
AFTIS and studied screen directing and screenwriting. Um, he, he, once he became paralyzed, he gave up his dream of being an actor. And um, then he, after making 10 short films, he wrote his feature film script about a gay disabled teenager and realized that there really wasn't anyone else in Australia who could play the role. So he played the role with oh, wow. his film partner. Wow. And he made uh, the feature film Pulse and they did it as an indie film. Um, I was one of the executive producer on it. And it ended up, he ended up getting nominated for best lead actor in a feature oh, on that, no budget. He ended up getting uh, roles it, it reignited his passion and he realized he was just going to go for it even though he was disabled and he you know he has hemiplegia and uses a wheel uh, a crutch to walk etc and he played elephant man in melbourne in one of the main stage theater companies and was uh, and was in lord of the flies with sydney theater company the feature got selected for the at BFI for one of their film festivals and they flew him to London and as a result of that he got a top agent in London oh and he's just been playing lead roles on the West End in London and um, he was just recently he got best lead actor uh, at the stage debut awards in London for his uh, he played uh, a modern version of Richard III called Teenage Dick and then he was playing opposite um, Amelia Clark in a production of The Seagull which got shut down by COVID three nights before opening night. So he came back to Australia and now he's just actually finished two feature films playing lead roles. So what I'm saying is he, he has battled and challenged not only life changing, you know, life and death challenges and you know having to go through months and months and years of rehab and all of that he decided he wasn't going to give up his dream of acting and he's gone on and he studied not just with me but he studied in in London and New York he's regularly he's got he has acting coaches in Sydney he's kept up all those skills and um and I realised that, you know, one of my teachers at RADA said, an actor isn't an actor because they choose to be, but because they have to be, because nothing else will fill that need in them to express themselves creatively in that way. So I suppose that's my... That, that is... Um, what a way to end. What... Uh, that's the best um, <laughs> answer I've ever been given, and, I, and you must be super proud. Uh, that's a that's a great. And Daniel story. Monks, who I'm very proud of, very proud of my other two children too. One is <laughs> a lawyer, and one is a doctor. But uh, I yeah. I tell that story about Daniel just because, you know, it's it's inspiring. It's inspiring. Yeah, and listen to your heart and think. All right, what would be the worst that I that would happen if I dedicated this period of time to really focusing on my craft skills? I might not make as much money in that time, but I won't necessarily die. I, mm -hmm. I can always do other, you know, side hustles and jobs to pay the rent, as every artist throughout history has done at times. But I think you have to listen to your heart and not get to the age of 70 or 80 and think oh i wonder if i, know. I could have mm -hmm. you know <laughs> succeeded yeah and it that is brilliant thank you very much for doing this that was um that was fantastic yeah thank you very much what a, what a, what a great chat um <laughs> wonderful all the best you. and all the best